Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Hello everyone, this is Meghna Bhatt from Prevent Connect. I'm excited to be here today in Chicago with Jody Haskin, right, and Lydia Sharp, uh, and JJ Park. Um, I will um, let our speakers introduce themselves and we will be talking about the intersection of disability and human trafficking and the implications on prevention. Hey, my name is Jody Haskin. I work for the International Organization for Adolescents, otherwise known as IOFA. I'm an anti-trafficking coordinator there, which means that I work on projects that help to build capacity in other service providing organizations and also provide training and technical assistance for for organizations who work with vulnerable youth, who may work with youth who are trafficked. My name is Lydia Sharp. I am an Equal Justice Works Fellow and Staff Attorney here at Equip for Equality, sponsored by Greenberg Traurig LLP. My fellowship focus is on providing outreach and advocacy for people with disabilities who have either been sexually abused or sex trafficked. So there are two general things that I do. One is training in the community throughout Illinois on the intersection of disability and trafficking, and then also providing direct legal advocacy for people who have been abused or trafficked. My name is Jay Jin Park. Uh, I am the co-chair of the Illinois Imagine Chicago team, as well as a member of the steering committee for the National Human Trafficking and Disability Work Group. My background has been uh, doing prevention and education for gender-based violence issues and connecting the intersectionality between disability, uh, gender-based violence, and Thank you. How is everyone doing? Great. Great. Awesome. Um, so Lydia, please share with us a little bit about your fellowship at Equip for Equality. So I started my fellowship in September of 2016 and my fellowship focus is on the intersection of disability and trafficking and also sexual abuse. So a lot of the first few months of my fellowship has been working on the training aspect, being in the community doing trainings at adult use and various arenas around the state, uh, looking at this intersection of disability and trafficking, primarily to educate individuals who are already um, investigating allegations of abuse and helping them see when the allegations of financial exploitation or sexual abuse may actually translate into human trafficking. Uh, we see that there's a lot of still misconceptions and myths around what human trafficking is and its existence here in Illinois and in the U.S. So a big piece of my fellowship so far has been education and training. Um, but I also have developed an individual caseload mm -hmm. of clients who have been sexually abused or trafficked. Thank you. Um, the fellowship does sound fascinating and I'm sure it's, it's been challenging also. Yeah. Um, so while working, um, you also have worked with the Human Trafficking and Disabilities Work Group, right? Mm -hmm. So what has been accomplished, like what have you noticed, like what has been accomplished or missing in terms of primary prevention, you know, whether it's research or policy? So one of the reasons my fellowship exists is because of the lack thereof <laughs> of a lot of research and resources that have been able mm -hmm. to be devoted to this intersection. So a big part of my fellowship then has to collaborate with groups like with Jody at IOFA and with Jay Jin with Illinois Imagines and really bringing our minds together on figuring out what uh, policies and research should be in place. Uh, Jody has been a big um, help in getting the work group off the ground and we've had two steering committee meetings now. Right. Um, and really a lot of the conversation has been, what do we need to do? Uh, what kinds of subcommittees should we have? And for me, what I noticed coming into my fellowship, a big need uh, was data collection. Uh, a lot of what you need to get more resources, of course, and grant writing and all of those things you need, you know, but, uh, what, this, what we know exists, um, mm -hmm. the trafficking of people with disabilities. So that has been a big room for growth is how, how do we do that? How do we um, understand this intersection a little bit more clearly through data collection? Yeah. Thank you. And I know we speak about like creating accessible and available resources and policies for survivors of tra trafficking with disabilities is definitely important. 
but um what work is being done or are you hoping you know in terms of preventing trafficking or gender violence and other forms of oppression you know happening in the first place um i know you spoke about educating about you know the intersect about the intersection of uh, disability and human trafficking how do you see that can be helpful for other preventionists one way that uh, Joe talked about increasing prevention has been through cross training in both the disability communities and in the trafficking communities. When it comes to um, prevention of trafficking, it's very difficult because sure. you yeah. might not even understand what some of the after someone may be in a trafficking situation or they may already be groomed. Sure. Um, so I think part of the awareness comes from helping people identify some of the risk factors, mm -hmm. and that's one of the biggest things. So okay. being able to help that help people who are vulnerable mm -hmm. understand what trafficking looks like. So providing them with information about um, mm -hmm. some risky situations that sure. they might be getting into. We think it's important to help professionals who mm -hmm. work with vulnerable youth have the capability to identify mm -hmm. when somebody is potentially trafficked or okay. is trafficked. Okay. Um, so that might be something that's different when it comes to prevention. Sure. Um, so for us, we're trying to provide services for people who may already be trafficked. Okay. So that everyone knows who is working with vulnerable youth who may be trafficked, that the, the youth are victims. They're okay. not They're not criminals. Sure. They're not bad people. Mm -hmm. They're victims of a crime. So for us, that's what we find is, is most important. And then um, when we're working with vulnerable youth, mm -hmm. youth who have a disability are also very vulnerable. So we're, that's where the intersection comes in for us. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to human trafficking in our communities and what that looks like. And so a lot of the education that I'm a part of when it comes to training is working with service providers on the identification and risk factors that are particularly um, present in okay. disability communities. So that does require a certain cross-training, both in the disability community, mm -hmm. working with service providers and individuals with disabilities themselves sure. about human trafficking. What does this look like and why is this population particularly vulnerable to mm -hmm. trafficking, whether it's because of access to benefits, um, mm -hmm. traffickers targeting individuals in order to access their mm -hmm. benefits, or vulnerable individuals who might be exploited by their caretaker or somebody close to them in a position of trust. So speaking within that sphere yeah. is one area of prevention. But then there's also within the anti-trafficking community, uh, educating on the existence of this intersection of disability and trafficking and not just saying, this is another population mm -hmm. you should be focusing on, but also making sure that the, any resources and outreach materials that are created are accessible um, and making sure that they are widely distributed in different arenas that may be not traditionally thought of as important outreach venues. Absolutely. So there's definitely kind of two distinct kinds of trainings happening and sometimes there's just not as much collaboration between the two uh, groups and so I think part of the working group and what we're trying, the three of us at this table are trying to do mm -hmm. is making sure that we're talking to each other and making sure. sure that both spheres are learning from each other and learning how we can increase prevention and training mm -hmm. across the two communities. Thank you. And if I can add to that, sure. in, in terms of one of the thing, one of the reasons why I'm very um, uh, happy of this collaboration and this, and, and this work is because in terms of risk factors, um, in addition to all the existing stigma and discomfort around mainstream mm -hmm. society talking about gender-based violence in general, especially sexual assault and sex sure. crime. There's also a lot of stigma and misconceptions around disability communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, and com if you add all the stigma and the misinformation and the pathology around both of those, it makes victimization and risk of victimization for people with disabilities for trafficking, for various in, in, intimate partner violence and sexual violence, um, they have an increased risk. And understanding disability culture of the, of the diversity of disability, of getting an understanding of how, what it means to be accessible. Okay. Um, there's physical accessibility, but there's also communication and language. There's also understanding um, how to interact with people and thought processes mm -hmm. for different disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and moving toward 
that kind of environment for a service provider, for everyone encompassing um, counseling, advocacy, law enforcement, medical care, anyone in any system that has interactions with survivors, um, helping them to understand how to be accessible and approachable to people with disabilities. This makes it much more um, hopeful for survivors to disclose and also feel like I'm not seen as a freak because of my disabilities. And that's something that within the disability community is something that is a very real concern. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I should say I, I'm speaking this as a person with, with multiple disabilities sure. myself. So I you know, share some of my self personal experiences with disability. I appreciate it. Thank you. I also think another yeah. benefit of, sure. of the disability and human trafficking work group is um, that people who already work with mm -hmm. human trafficking survivors and victims of trafficking already have a lot of resources on hand about how to deal and work and um, provide resources for the, the sure. trafficking victims and survivors. Um, but by also understanding what kind of resources are available for youth and adults mm -hmm. who have disabilities is also helpful for them. Sure. Um, they might not be aware of some additional resources that, um, that youth and adults are eligible for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think it's important to like, as you said, like to kind of address the underlying like, you know, um, misconceptions, misinformation, a lack of, a, of awareness, uh, whether it's just about disabilities. And, and in addition, you have these complex multi-layer, you know, uh, other myths again, and you know, wrong information and false beliefs out there. And it's also um, it's also, I think, in general, like the mainstream community, we, we don't, we often, and I'm not saying we means us, but we often in general, like, overlook that, you know, people with disabilities can also be, you know, possible survivors mm -hmm. of sexual violence or, you know, human trafficking. Like, it, people don't connect that. And that that's where, as you mentioned, is like one of those risk factors that kind of can work towards preventing you know, addressing the intersectionality and kind of preventing from any of this violence happening, you know, in the first place. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission, or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.